Hello again everybody and you can see on the bench today we've got the CR Analyzer model number TE46. Now I'm sure that you'll remember that I left you on a little bit of a cliffhanger last week didn't I and uh, I'm sorry about that but I'm afraid I did become just a little bit stuck on trying to deal with these capacitors here and as I explained last time one of these capacitors in fact this one here it's actually wired between the actual live terminal the primary of the transformer which has got 230 volts live on it and it was actually wired to the actual chassis onto this black wire here which goes to the chassis now originally the chassis and the actual enclosure of this piece of test equipment it wasn't earthed because it was only connected through a two core cable. So the whole chassis and the enclosure was floating with respect to ground and the problem with that is if we get any leakage at all on this capacitor we would get leakage from the live incoming 230 volt mains to the chassis and of course this chassis could become live to the touch. Now after 60 years this capacitor is almost certainly going to be leaky although I said that before about the electrolytics and they were perfect but you absolutely wouldn't trust one of these capacitors these days you would want to replace it with a modern safety Y type suppression capacitor so I am going to go ahead and I'm going to order some of them and hopefully we'll replace them later because I need to order them and I've got to wait for them to arrive but you can see I've gone ahead and uh, I fully installed the mains cable now and I've also tidied up some of the wiring and you can see that we've also now got the permanent earth connection so everything is looking a little bit tidier unfortunately I've just noticed that we've got a capacitor that's fallen off here now this one is another 600 volt and I think that is a 10 nanofarad capacitor. So seeing as that capacitor has fallen off its terminal, it might be worth just doing an insulation resistance test on this because it looks as though it's the same type of capacitor as these paper oil ones which are down here. So we could actually see if there is any leakage on them. I would suspect that there is, but we won't know until we actually test it. But regardless, we will replace these anyway. However, before I do go ahead and switch this on for the first time, I think I would just like to finish just tidying everything up and finish cleaning it because I want to put all the knobs back on and clean the face so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this last remaining this is the main potentiometer that reads out the actual capacitance or the resistance value so again it's very dirty and dusty it looks like it's got coffee stains on it or something so I want to remove this but before I can do that I'm just got to remove this piece of plastic here with a pointer on it so let me do that So let's see if I can just remove this without losing the spacers and all the other parts of it. Yep, got that. I'm just going to screw these nuts back on because if I don't do that I'm definitely going to lose them. And we'll put that in our box of knobs because we'll give all these a bit of a clean shortly. And hopefully we can now just take off this uh, main tuning dial off. And now that we have exposed the whole of the front panel we've taken all the knobs off. It's going to make it much easier to actually give this a clean. Now when it comes to the face plate of an instrument we're never exactly sure what type of ink or paint has been used to put the lettering on and I've got to admit it wouldn't be the for the first time that I've actually given some of these a wipe only to find out that I've wiped off some of the lettering so having learnt that lesson I do try to be a little bit more careful now but, I thought, but before we start cleaning it with a solvent or anything like that I think what I'm just going to do is I'm just going to try to brush some of the dust off it because if you start scrubbing away at this panel while it's covered in dust all that's going to happen is we're going to rub that dust into the paintwork and scratch it. Now the condition of this instrument it's actually really good I suspect it's had pretty much no use whatsoever. Now one of the most useful cleaning chemicals I've found for cleaning front panels and in fact just for generally cleaning equipment and stuff like that is uh, it's just some cheap window cleaning fluid I think the majority of what's in here is just a water with some detergent, some alcohol, and this one says it's got some vinegar in it as well. But I found that this is quite a gentle cleaner, and I've been fairly lucky in that it hasn't caused any damage to any equipment I've used it on so far. And it also tends not to leave any type of uh, sticky residue, which I found some of the foam cleaners do leave a residue. Now it would be quite interesting to know what you guys use as a general workshop cleaner for this type of job. So again, please leave it in the comments. So I'm not going to flood this with detergent, let's just put a little bit on. And I think the first test is, uh, let me just try just giving it a little rub here. 
let me just see if any black comes off it or if it, does it have a tendency to rub the lettering off no it doesn't that seems pretty good so I think we're safe to continue there so I'm going to continue giving this a clean I'll bring you back when I finish so while we're in here it would probably be rather remiss of me if we didn't go ahead and check out some of the other capacitors so we've got one of these other Lily brand capacitors here now this one says oil dash CP dash A and it's uh, it's 10 nanofarads at 600 volts working and uh, again made in Japan now it's actually the same type of capacitor as the one that goes between the uh, live side of the primary of the transformer to the chassis so I guess if this one is good or bad that might actually help indicate the condition of this other capacitor down here okay so that's coming up as 1.5 meg ohm that is no good and at 500 volts it's coming up as 1 meg ohm so this capacitor is definitely leaking so seeing as we've got the insulation resistance meter out we might as well test this capacitor that's installed between the primary and the chassis so we're still set to 250 volts let's see what that comes up as okay that's coming up as 45 Mega ohm, so that's a fairly high resistance, but really it should be measuring infinite. Let's see if that drops when we go up to 500 volts. Okay, but at 500 volts, that actually drops to well, it, you can see it falling as the capacitor breaks down. I'd expect to see this as being you know an infinite reading, so yeah, this capacitor is on its way out, I believe. So they really do need replacing. Now having given this just a little bit of consideration, I think the best thing we can do while we wait for the correct Y type suppression capacitor to arrive, I think the best thing we can do is just snip it out for now. So uh, let me just do that snippy snip snip. Oh and just before I solder the other end of this capacitor on, I did want to show you what a new good capacitor looks like, so let me do that. And this capacitor is rated for a thousand volts, so let's go to the full thousand volts. And you can see that it measures, in terms of resistance, it measures infinite, so this is in excess of a gig ohm. So you can see that, you know, a brand new capacitor does measure nice and high. Always check the meter. Yeah, the meter's working. Now I'm sure most of you are waiting for me to now touch the end of this capacitor because it will almost certainly be charged up. Yeah, little crack there. Now of course I haven't actually checked to see which way around I've installed this capacitor where the outer foil is because this isn't Carlson's lab. However, when you replace your capacitors you can do it any way you want. So I did manage to track down some Y-rated capacitors in the end, but it certainly wasn't easy. So these Y-rated capacitors that I found, these are actually Y2 class. So they're actually going to see about 250 volts in operation. Uh, and these have got an AC working voltage of 305 volts. Now I would have liked something a little bit higher than that, because you never know what kind of transients you've got on the AC line. Well, following on from the end of last week's video, I hope there won't be any explosions this time, so let's carry on and switch the power on. So, time to switch on and we'll see if anything starts smoking. Oh, we've got a little red neon indicator, that's very pretty, isn't it? Well, look at that, we've been rewarded with a bright green glowing magic eye valve. Isn't that a thing of beauty? Now as I said in last week's video I've never actually used one of these CR analyzers before but I have in the past used some quite similar AC and DC bridges so let's go ahead and give it a go. So I think we'll start off our testing by just seeing if the resistance range works and uh, to do that we're going to use this little test board. Do you remember I made this a few weeks ago when we were looking at the high impedance voltmeters so all this board consists of is just a number of different resistors and I've arranged these in decade values but one thing that I have done since last time is I've gone ahead and I've actually just measured all these resistance values using a fairly accurate uh, digital voltmeter so rather than just relying on the uh, on the markings on the components and whatever 
percentage tolerance they've got on them. I've actually gone ahead and uh, measured them, and I've just written that number below. Now, they were actually fairly close to the mark values. There's nothing very far out. So let's go ahead and use this resistance board. And in theory, we should be able to measure these resistances using our bridge. So my little board here does go to 1 ohm, but I actually think 1 ohm will probably be too low for this because I think it'll be off the scale on here. So I think we'll start the measurement at 10 ohms. So I think we need to be on the Rx times 1 here. So uh, that's what we are set to. So let's plug my little board in. So in theory what should happen, we should be able to adjust this until the number on here is actually multiplied by the number on this dial here. So this is times 1. So when we spin this wheel to the 10 position, if this analyzer is working properly, we should see the magic eye starting to open. So yeah, let's try that. You can see there's a little shadow at the bottom. We're looking for the little shadow to get wider and we want it to become as wide as possible. Now when we've actually adjusted the readout dial and got the magic eye, it, we've got this gap here as wide as possible, we then go to the read off dial and read the number off it and that should tell us what the resistance value is of our 10 ohm resistor. Hopefully you can see that, there it goes. And I think I've got it adjusted there to its maximum. So the actual resistance value we've got here is actually 9.7 ohms. So you can see that the indicating dial, it's actually reading a little bit high because it's indicating closer to 11. So I'm going to move the crocodile clip now to our 100 ohm resistor and we'll have another try. So we are still on our R times 1 scale, so we should be looking for a number indicated on our dial here. We should be looking for a number of 100. So let me just uh, turn the wheel. Oh, right, OK, starting to open now. Starting to open at about 80. And as you can see now, the indicating wheel is very close to 100. It's maybe just half a bees dick over, but it's very close. Let's try the 1K resistor now. Now, as you can probably see, our indicating wheel only goes up to 500, so we're not going to be able to measure 1K with this. So we're going to have to change the function select and select a different range. And I think for our next measurement, we're going to need that R times 100 range. And again we can see that our indicating disc is just slightly out. This should be indicating 1K, but it's actually indicating closer to 11K. Well I thought I'd just bring you back to do our final 20 mega ohm resistance measurement, because that's as high as I can go using my little test board here. Now as for the range switch, we are on the R times 1 mega ohm, but because we're on the 1 mega ohm, it actually uses a different scale here on the uh, readout disc. So previously we were using this top RC scale here, the one at the top of the wheel, but now we actually have to use this RX 1 mega ohm scale, which is the one underneath it, one down. So in theory, all that I have to do is now rotate the disc till we get to 20 and the magic eye should fully open. Oh, I can see it's starting to open now. OK, I think I've got our eye about fully open there. And as you can see, the readout disc does agree perfectly with this 20 mega ohm resistance that we're measuring. It's bang on the 20. Well, it seems like we've gotten a little bit of a roll here with our measurements, so let's go ahead and try measuring some capacitance values. Now you can also see that just like our resistance decade board, I've gone ahead and I've actually made a capacitance decade board. And I've got our values of capacitance arranged between 10 picofarad all the way up to 1000 microfarad. And again I've taken my DER meter and I've measured the values of each of these capacitors. And I actually did go through my collection of capacitors to try to find capacitors that were as close to possible to the mark value, but they're not absolute. So for example the 10 picofarad capacitor is actually 11.9, the 100 picofarad is 102, the 1 nanofarad is 1.04, the 10 nanofarad is 10.06, the 100 nanofarad is 100.5, the 1 microfarad is 0.99 microfarad, 
the 10 microfarad is 9.3, the 100 microfarad is 96.2 and finally the 1000 microfarad is 920. Now strangely enough when I was actually measuring all of my electrolytics I've got quite a stock of them. Interestingly enough pretty much all of them measured well under the mark value. Maybe they will come up a little bit when they've had some voltage across them and that layer of insulation has built up. I'm not sure but certainly all my electrolytic capacitors did just read a little under. And we're also going to have to adjust the function select switch to the capacitance range. And we're going to start off by C times 0 0.00001 as our multiplier. Now I do have a feeling that our capacitance analyzer, it's not going to be able to analyze this 10 picofarad capacitor. I think it's going to be just a little bit too small because it's going to be off the edge of the, uh, of the disc here, of the readout disc. But we'll have a go. And as we did before for measuring those resistance ranges, all we actually have to do is we have to adjust the readout disc here and look for the opening of the magic eye. Now I can actually see with the disc set to minimum, it's already open. So I think that our indicating disc, it's probably indicating about 15 picofarads there, maybe slightly over. Now I'm actually on a 10 picofarad capacitor, but I did actually measure this capacitance as closer to 12. So it seems to be out, our measurement seems to be out by, well, probably about 3 picofarads, but I guess I'm classing that as still being pretty good for an instrument of this nature, which is just a general service grade instrument. So let's see if we do any better on the 100 picofarad capacitor. So we should be looking for a 10 on the wheel here. Okay, and I think we're actually just slightly over. So we're measuring about 110 picofarad, whereas the actual capacitance value is about 100. So we're slightly over. I've moved on now to the 1 nanofarad capacitor. So we should be looking for a reading of 100 on the dial. Okay, I'm about 95 now. I think that's fully open and again we're measuring just slightly over at 1.1 nanofarad. So let's go to our 10 nanofarad and we've also got to now change range because we've run out of adjustment on this dial so we've got to go to the C times 0 0.001. So this time we should be looking for an indication of 10 here. Now as you can see as I actually rotate the disc from one end to the other we're not actually getting any opening of the eye. So I was expecting it to start opening around the 10 mark but yeah it just refuses to open. So either there's something wrong with this range or there's something wrong with my 10 nanofarad capacitor. So to prove that let's move to the 100 nanofarad capacitor here. Now for our 100 nanofarad capacitor we should be getting some opening around the 100 mark on the disc here. And uh, yeah, we're not getting that. In fact, it doesn't seem to open at any position on the disc. So it does in fact look like there's something wrong with this C times 0 0.001 range. We're going to have to investigate that, find out what's going on. I wonder if we can just get a tail end indication on the C times 0 0.01 range. Let's try that, which we are doing there. Now it looks like there's nothing wrong with our 100 nanofarad capacitor and of course we didn't really expect there to be a problem with it. So it does in fact look like this times 0 0.001 range must be defective. So we will take a look at that but before we do that I just want to finish testing the rest of the ranges. So let's go to the 1 microfarad and seeing as we've already switched to the 0.1 range here, we're going to be looking for a number 10 on the uh, balancing wheel. Oh, and there she goes, lucky number 10. And according to the reading on the balance wheel, we are just very slightly over, but I think that's close enough for me. Well, as you can see, we're now down to our final two capacitors, which are 100 microfarad and 1000 microfarad. But in order to measure those, we've got to change range again, and we're going to go to the C times 10 range. And we'll select our 100 microfarad capacitor. 
Now as we did for the 1 meg resistance range, we've actually also got to use a different scale here for our times 10 on the capacitance range. So rather than using the top scale that we've been using for most of the measurement, again we're going to drop down to this lower scale here. So by now you know about as well as I do how to operate this piece of equipment. So we're on the 100 microfarad range and we're set to times 10. So can anybody tell me what we have to turn the balance wheel to in order to get the eye to open? Okay, have you shouted it out? Let's see if you're right. Oh, I can see a little bit of opening. Well, I think we're about there. And for those of you that shouted out 10, well, you were correct. Now, for those of you that didn't get the correct answer, I'm going to give you all a chance to redeem yourself. So I'm going to select the 1000 microfarad capacitor. And as you can see, the eye's closed. So again, just shout out what number we're looking for on the balance wheel to get the eye to open. Have you shouted? Yeah, I think I just about heard that. Here we go. Starting to open already, I think. And as you can see, the reading on our balance wheel is spot on 100. And that's correct. But just looking at the little graduation marks on our balance wheel, you can see that the scale is terribly compressed at this end. So, if, for example, if you wanted to look for a capacitance value of maybe 150, it would actually be probably be quite hard to actually find that. The gap between the 100 and the 200 now is relatively short. I think before I go back and fix this capacitance range, I'd just like to check out some of the other functions of the instrument just to make sure they're all good. So I'm going to take the function select switch here and I'm going to move it into the leakage stroke insulation resistance position. And what the instrument allows us to do, we can use this voltage selection knob here to apply various voltage across our capacitors and then we can measure the leakage and it gives us two leakage ranges. So we've got a 10 milliamp leakage range and we've also got a 1 milliamp leakage range. Now before I actually select that leakage range, we've got to make sure we've got the voltage set correctly for the capacitor because this goes all the way up to 600 volts. Well I've only got a 25 volt capacitor into circuit at the moment so I've got to make sure this is turned down to minimum. So we've actually got this turn down to the 3 volts. So let's turn this to the 10 milliamps and of course we wouldn't expect any leakage but the needle might just flick up here when we actually turn it on because it's going to charge up the capacitor first. So let's turn on. Okay and the needle does in fact flick over. You can also see it's turned the magic eye valve off because the magic eye isn't used for doing the leakage tests. And you can see with our voltage selection set to 3, we're actually reading just slightly more than that on our voltmeter. It's reading 3.2, but I'm not going to worry about that. So let's try selecting 6 volts and see if our leakage increases. OK, the needle again just flicks up, but then it returns back down again. Ah, idiot. You know, that confused me for a moment. I'm going to select 12 volts next, but before I do, let me bring you in on the meter here. So 12 volts now, and you should see the needle flick up as we switch between 6 volts and 12 volts because some current's going to flow into our capacitor and the meter's going to interpret that as leakage, but it will settle down again. So here we go, 12 volts. Bang, all the way over, and it should come back to zero, assuming our capacitor isn't in fact leaking. And again, rather than 12 volts, we're actually a little bit high at 13.8. And the highest voltage I can go to for this particular capacitor is 25 volts. So let's just go on to 25. The needle shall bounce over again. And it's coming back down and our voltage is climbing up. 
Now I think that the reason that we're getting these higher voltage readings and what's actually marked on the voltage selection switch is because the transformer in this unit is a 230 volt transformer and unfortunately my mains voltage at this house is particularly high. If we were to measure the mains voltage we would probably find that it was actually closer to 250 volts rather than 230. So of course all these are going to be slightly out. Now we can't actually go any higher on the voltage selection switch because this capacitor is limited to 25 volts. So what we're going to do is we're going to turn the instrument off and when you turn it off it does actually discharge the capacitors. You can see the reading is falling relatively quickly there and what we'll do is we'll just disconnect it. I'm going to see if I can find a higher voltage capacitor. So luckily I finally managed to answer my own question of why I keep this collection of old and defunct capacitors because we can actually use one of them to test the leakage range because I'm hoping that these old capacitors are going to be a little bit more leaky than the new ones are. So let's try it. So we've got a Dubalier capacitor which is 32 microfarads and it's rated at 450 volts so let's give that a go. Now if you read the instructions for our capacitor analyzer it does actually give you some warnings about using the leakage and the insulation resistance range because potentially these terminals could have as much as 600 volts on them and that could actually charge up a capacitor to a, have a reasonable amount of energy inside and uh, it would certainly give you a little bit of a tickle if you were to get between these terminals here. So yeah, so be careful if you're using one of these. It's not like today where everything's double and triple triple shrouded like you know the terminals on a modern digital meter these are going to have up to 600 volts on them so you don't want to put your tongue across them now we also want to make sure you wire your capacitor the right way around because you don't want it to explode in your face either which could definitely happen now we can't go to 600 volts on here but we can go to 450 so let's do that so just in case this capacitor's short circuit, I am in fact going to start off at 3 volts and we'll increase the voltage and see if we get any leakage. So we'll turn on, on 10 milliamps. Got a little bit of a flick of the needle there, but I think it's settled down again. So let's step our voltage up and see if we get any leakage. So there's 3 volts, no leakage. 6, nope, don't think so. 12, seem okay. 25. Is there a little bit of leakage there? Not sure there might be. Let's go to 50. Nope, I think I was imagining it. 150. Ah, okay. So at 150 volts, we're actually starting to see some leakage now. Now having just said that we were getting leakage, I can see that the needle is actually continuing to fall. So I guess what's actually happening is we're actually reforming this old capacitor because the current that it's drawing is actually falling the longer we leave it connected to this supply. But looking at the voltage in our fluke meter, we can see we're actually at over 290 volts and in theory we should be on the 250 volt range. So yeah, it is actually putting out more voltage than it should. So we're going to have to be a little bit careful using this instrument. So let's go to 300. And again on 300 we're actually reading closer to 350. I'm going to go to 350. So I actually think when we select our 400 range based on this high voltage output I suspect that's probably going to take us all the way to 450. So let's just do that. And in fact, yes, it has taken us just a little bit above that at 454 volts. Now, back in the day, the rule of thumb for reforming old capacitors like this, they used to say you would reform it at its working voltage for five minutes and then one minute for every month the capacitor had been in storage. So for this capacitor here that hasn't been in use for probably 50 years or more, it would probably actually take quite a long time to let it fully reform. And I think I'm just a little bit impatient to wait for that. Now so far we've been looking at the leakage on the 10 milliamp range, but I think we can actually go to the 1 milliamp range now. Now as you can see on the flute meter we are actually overdriving this capacitor to the tune of about 25 volts, which we really shouldn't be doing. So I think I will actually just turn this back to the 350 because I don't want the thing to go bang. Now according to our meter here, with about 420 volts across our capacitor, it's leaking at about 0.2 of a milliamp, 
So having left our capacitor to reform for about 40 minutes, you can see that the current has finally dropped to about 0.1 of a milliamp. Now I expect 0.1 milliamp to be a totally acceptable leakage current for a capacitor of this size and working voltage. However, would I trust a 70 year old electrolytic capacitor with 400 volts across it? To be quite honest, no. Well, I think it's about time we took a closer look at our C times 0 0.001 capacitance range. Well, I've taken a look at our circuit diagram, and I think it's this 0.04 microfarad capacitor that could be the problem. So this capacitor, in fact, there's a series of capacitors here which are actually used as part of the bridge balancing circuit. And uh, there is a capacitor for each of the uh, capacitance ranges, and they're, they're used as a reference. So I think the problem is these capacitors, as we've seen earlier, they've gone leaky, and I suspect that pretty much any leakage through this capacitor could cause a problem. Now there is quite a few other components which are in circuit but those components are also common to the resistance measurement circuit and uh, those resistance measurements seem to be good so I think that we probably have got a problem with this capacitor here but of course I'm not certain. Now the only problem that I see changing this out is it's a 0.04 microfarad and uh, 0.04 it's not a preferred value. I did have a quick look online and uh, you can get a 0.04 capacitor from Mauser which would probably be suitable but I'd have to ship that all the way from America and uh, to quite honest I'm far too tight to actually spend the money on doing that so I think what we'll do is we'll just try and put a couple of capacitors together and uh, see if we can bodge something up. So just looking at the capacitor it is another of these Lillibrand capacitors 0.04 microfarad 600 volts working it doesn't tell us anything about the actual tolerance for this capacitor given that it is a reference capacitor you would assume that it should have quite a high tolerance but in this case I doubt that it does it doesn't look anything special to me let's go ahead and test it well as you can see it's actually measuring 65 nanofarads which isn't right because it should be actually measuring closer to 40 and let's also check it for leakage. We'll start off at 250 volts. It should actually read infinity on here. Let's see how we go. Okay, so it's reading 0.2 of a mega ohm. So effectively this capacitor is short circuit. So taking a look through my collection of capacitors, it turns out that I've actually only got one 68 nanofarad capacitor. And uh, this one is rather dog-eared. It looks as though I've pulled this out of something in the past, but it's all I've got, so we're gonna to have to use it. And what we need to do is we need to install that in series with a 100 nanofarad. And uh, the series combination should make up pretty close to uh, 40. So we'll give that a go. Let's just check what this one is. Should be 68. Let's give it a measure. Okay, it's a little bit low, 65. Let's try putting that in series now with 100. hundred. Thirty-nine We're not a million miles off, are we? So given that I've only got the one... 68 but I do have quite a few capacitors here that are in the 100 range maybe we can do some select on test try to get a little bit closer to the 40 we're looking for should we try this one? Oh, 40.09 that's pretty damn close isn't it Yeah, that'll have to do. Well, some considerable time later, I think it's time to give our capacitance tester our 0 0.001 range a go. So let's go ahead and I think we need to hook up the uh, 10 nanofarad capacitor, don't we? So let's do that. I guess we've got a switch on, haven't we? So there we go, on. Let's wait a few moments for the magic eye to warm up. There we go. It does actually heat up quite quickly, this. So if my repair is good, if we adjust the balance wheel to 10, we should get the magic eye to open. So let's hit it. Here we go. Oh, something's happening. Okay, well, it is slightly over 10, isn't it? What's that? I think that's about... That's about 11 on this dial, isn't it? So we are slightly over, but it's definitely working now, whereas it wasn't working before. And now let me swap over to our 100 nanofarad capacitor, so I'll do that. 
the eye's fully closed. So again on the balance wheel we should be looking for a reading of about a hundred this time. So is anything going to happen? I think it will. Oh, bit of something happening. Well look at that, the hundred nanofarad measurement is absolutely bang on, couldn't be any better. Well I'm sure you'll remember this year I said I was going to look at more test equipment because I'd got a bit sick of changing capacitors in old vintage valve radios. But it just goes to show there really is no escaping those dodgy capacitors. It's always the capacitors isn't it? Bah! So hopefully the next quick fix that I'm going to do is just to offer this analogue meter here just a little bit more protection because these can be quite easily damaged by overcurrent. So one easy way to prevent too much current flowing through the meter is actually just to limit the voltage that it can see across these two terminals here. And a popular fix for analogue meters is just to install a couple of diodes here. Now you don't necessarily need two diodes. I've installed two diodes in the event that this can see some AC and uh, it's just a precaution but the idea is I've used two shock key diodes and what will happen is if these meter terminals get energized to more than about 0.3 of a volt what will happen is the diodes will start conducting and it will shunt current away from the meter movement and it should offer it some protection quite often if you grossly overload the meter it will actually burn out these diodes but often they will go short circuit and protect the meter. Now it isn't a guaranteed fix but it sometimes does help. Now the other thing you can also do is you can put some capacitance across the meter here and that will just help slow down the meter movement. It will offer some additional damping and it just helps stop the needle pinging across really hard. So that is also something you can do but for this particular meter I'm not going to bother doing that. Now interestingly enough as you can probably see the action of this meter it does actually seem pretty well damped as it is. Okay well that should help in the event of an accident. So having gone ahead and just replaced the batteries in my fluke voltmeter here I decided to go back and just recheck the voltage measurements that we had for this voltage selector switch because certainly they were reading higher than I would have liked. So you can now see that the 3 volt setting is reading 2.9 so we'll do the 6, bang on, 12, 0.2 volts over, 25, 50, 150, so we're 5 volts over, 250, about 8 volts over, 300, 9 volts over, 350, 10 volts over, 400, 10 volts over, 450, and we're 8 volts over, and finally the 600 volt range, and we're just 7 volts over. So I don't think I'm going to go ahead and make any adjustments to that. So as I stupidly just demonstrated, the batteries in your voltmeter going flat can actually make quite a big difference to your readings. So that really is a bit of a, a noob error. A little bit embarrassed about that. But I've shown you the mistake so you can avoid it. I think I really must give a safety warning about the position of these fuse terminals here that you can see. They really are very, very close to the metal chassis of the capacitor analyzer and if this piece of equipment wasn't earthed and these terminals were to come in contact with the chassis the whole instrument would become live and that would be very very dangerous. Now of course you know that I'm going to do the right thing which is uh, just pretend that I haven't seen it in fact and uh, yeah we'll just uh, we'll put it back in its box I think. Yeah. Well before we finish today it's only fair that we try out a couple of the other measurement functions so the one we're going to have a look at next is this insulation resistance test. So what this will do is it will actually measure the insulation resistance of something like a I don't know a transformer or maybe a high voltage capacitor and uh, really it's just another form of leakage test. In theory you should get very high readings on this meter here but if the insulation resistance is failing you'll get a much lower reading on this meter. So let's just give it a quick test. Now I don't actually want to put a short circuit on this insulation test because I believe that it can actually damage this meter. So we're just going to verify that the insulation range works by just checking the resistance of this 20 mega ohm resistor. 
Now we do have to be a little bit careful doing this because it does the insulation test at 600 volts so you know you've got to be a little bit careful what you're doing so we'll just put that on the bench there and uh, we need to switch to the insulation leakage range so we'll switch this one down here okay we're on the right range now so so our meter here should be indicating 20 mega ohms but unfortunately it isn't it's actually indicating about 50 but I've noticed if I just grab the switch it does actually come good So unfortunately, I think we've actually got a dirty contact. Okay, is that come good? Yeah, there we are. That's working now. And as you can see, the meter's indicating just a tad over 20 mega ohms because this is a 22 mega ohm resistor. And uh, as you can also see, the meter reading is pretty compressed as you go up in resistance values, but it does seem to be working. But definitely, if I just rock the switch, yeah, it kind of goes and comes. So yeah definitely got a dirty switch contact there so unfortunately it does look as though we're going to be going back into this piece of equipment and uh, maybe giving it a squirt a switch cleaner hopefully that's all it is so the final function of our CR analyzer that I'm going to take a look at today is something called the power factor now I think the power factor here is actually something that's a little difficult to explain. There's a couple of ways we could talk about it. We could say that it's a phase difference between the voltage and the current waveform. Or we could also say it's a ratio between true power and apparent power. But probably both of those descriptions don't practically take us very much further forward. So in this case I'm going to make a gross simplification and I'm just going to tell you that a capacitor really needs to have as low a power factor as possible. It shouldn't actually be drawing any power from the circuit. So we've actually got two capacitors here. We've got this one which it really did take some searching for. This is quite a bad capacitor and it exhibits a high power factor whereas this capacitor is a brand new one out of the box and uh, it's a good capacitor. So this one is 15 microfarad at 450 volts and this one is 16 microfarad at 450 volts. So in terms of rating they are similar but this one is probably about 70 years older than this one is. So first of all I'm going to show you how you actually use this. So you can only use the power factor reading on electrolytic capacitors and it only works on these two ranges here. So it works on the C times 0.01 range and the C times 10 range. It only works on those two ranges. So I'm going to show you what a bad capacitor looks like first. So I'm just going to clip on here and just adjust our balance wheel as we've done so many times before. So hopefully you can see there we've got an eye opening but in terms of actually how much this eye has opened it's probably less than any other capacitor that we've measured. So I think that's also an indicator that this isn't a very good capacitor. Let me try and just make sure we've got it as wide as we could do. So what we need to do now to measure our power factor, we actually have to increase this control here. And you can actually see it's marked between 0 and 70% power factor. Now we need to increase this control and what should happen is the eye should get wider. And when it goes to actually as wide as possible, when it goes to its widest uh, setting, then we come back here and we read off what the power factor is. So let me just start to increase this and hopefully it will get wider. You see that's got a little bit wider, hasn't it? Oh, I know it's getting smaller again, so I've gone a bit far. Let me try that again. Very sensitive control. Okay, I think it's about there. So it's just under 10. So the power factor of this capacitor is about 10. Now, if you take a look inside the manual of the CR analyzer, it actually gives you a table there where it actually shows you the relationship between power factor and working voltage for the capacitor. And for a capacitor that's got a 450 volt rating like this one, it says that the power factor for a perfect capacitor should be around 15. Well, actually, this capacitor is better than that in that it's actually 10. And it goes on to say that a capacitor of this size, if the power factor is about twice the nominal rating, so 2 times 15, which in this case would be 30, it would say that the capacitor is actually bad. So in theory, this is actually a good capacitor because it's actually only, well, it's actually less than 10. So it's actually even less than the stated value of a, a 450 volt capacitor. But let's just take a look at a brand new capacitor, for example. So this capacitor is very slightly lower in value in that it's only 15 microfarad rather than 16, but it is the same working voltage of 450 volts. So I'm just going to adjust our balance wheel again 
and I think that's as wide as I can get it. But just looking at it, this eye has actually opened considerably wider than it did for the, this capacitor. So I think that's a good indication that our old Plessy capacitor here is actually not particularly good. Now let's just increase the power factor control and we're looking for the eye to open more. And in fact it doesn't open more, it, it actually closes. So yeah, this does opposite to what the instructions tell you. So I can only guess that this is indicating that this capacitor is really good. It isn't actually consuming any power from the analyzer here because the because the current and the voltage are 90 degrees out of phase with each other, it's consuming no power. Whereas this capacitor is consuming power from the analyzer. So it's telling us it's bad. Now, given that we have got a capacitor analyzer here, let's just take a look at the leakage of it. Our old Plessy capacitor, it's actually leaking. And at 450 volts, it's actually leaking about just over two milliamps of current. So I'm just going to turn off the test now and what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace the Plessy with our brand new capacitor and we'll see what that looks like in terms of leakage. And the needle flicks over as the capacitor charges and then it starts to drop down again. So we're on the 10 milliamp range here but it's pretty much gone to zero. Let's go to the 1 milliamp range. So you can now see that our new capacitor is only drawing 0.02 milliamps so it's an order of magnitude better than our old Plessy capacitor. So I think the reason that the old Plessy capacitor showed a relatively poor power factor compared with the new capacitor is that it's actually gone slightly resistive so it's acting like a resistor rather than like a capacitor so the resistive element is actually drawing power from the analyzer and that's what the power factor meter was indicating. Now just before we finish today there's one final function of our CR analyzer that I'd like to take a look at and that's its ability to measure a transformer's winding ratio. And I have gone ahead and connected a transformer to the input terminals of the capacitor analyzer. Now it's actually quite important the way you actually connect the transformer under test to the terminals of the analyzer. And if you read the instructions it does lay down some rules. And as I've found it's important that you follow those rules or the test doesn't work properly. Now the first important rule is that the side of the transformer which has the most turns on it has to be connected to the A terminal here. Now in this case this is an audio output transformer from something like a valve radio. I'm not exactly sure where it's come from, I found it in the junk box. So the primary side of this type of transformer is going to have more turns on it because an audio output transformer is generally a step down transformer. So this yellow wire here is connected to the primary and the primary primary is the one with most turns on it and so it's connected to the A terminal on here. Now the side of the transformer that has the least number of warnings has to connect to terminal C at the bottom here. So again in this case it's this secondary. Oops it's just fallen off. Let's put that back on. And then you've got to take the other ends of the primary and secondary windings and you've got to join them together and you've got to connect them to terminal B here. Now when I first connected up this transformer I couldn't actually get the turns ratio measurement to work and uh, it isn't really very well explained in the manual why it wasn't work but what I found is the actual phasing of the windings which way around you connect them to the terminals is very important. Now the instructions tell you to start off with the low ratio and if you don't get the magic eye to open up you've got to transfer to the high ratio so we're going to follow those instructions try the low ratio first. So let's start adjusting the balance wheel and we'll see if the magic eye will open for us. Okay, well it has in fact opened for us there. But unfortunately we're on this low scale here and it's actually gone off the scale. So although it is trying to read there, it's actually on too low a measurement range. So according to the instructions, we actually have to switch on to the high range. So I'm going to do that now. I'm going to re-zero the wheel. I'm going to switch on to the high range. Click. And let's do it again. Oh, I think the eye's starting to open there, isn't it? OK, 
Okay, I think that's about at a maximum now and it's somewhere between here we're on the bottom scale on the balance wheel here and I'm reading it off and it looks like it's somewhere between it's somewhere between 45 and 50 I'm going to split the difference and let's call it a reading of 48 so the CR analyzer it's telling me that this transformer that we're testing it's got a ratio of 48 to 1 but has it now when it comes to determining the turns ratio of a transformer there's quite a few different ways you can do it. The simplest and the way that I tend to do it is I actually take my signal generator and I connect it to one pair of windings. In this case it turned out to be the primary and I inject some voltage into the transformer and I set up my signal generator to give the maximum output which in this case was about 7.06 volt and I had the frequency of the signal generator set to 50 hertz and the output was a sine wave. So we injected 7.06 volts into the prime of a transformer and to double check that I just measured it with a digital voltmeter. Now once I'd made this voltage measurement I disconnected the voltmeter from the primary side and I connected it to the secondary side of the transformer and again we measured the voltage but this time the voltage was a lot smaller because as I said earlier in this case it's a step down transformer and I actually only measured 145 millivolts so for 7.06 volts in, I measured 145 millivolts out. So we take the 7.06 volts measured across our primary and we divide it by the voltage which we measured across the secondary which is 145 millivolts. If you type that into a calculator, you'll find you get 48.6. And just to round that up slightly, that gives us a ratio of 48 to 1. And going back to the balance wheel, I really don't think we could be any closer. So it is definitely just before the 50 mark. So it's after 45 and it's just before the 50. So I think that really is absolutely a perfect measurement. Our capacitor analyzer really couldn't have done any better. So it does seem that this instrument really is quite good at determining the turns ratio of a transformer. Now one more thing I think you should be aware of when using the type of AC bridge which is employed within our capacitor resistor analyzer is that the terminal voltage here can be relatively high. So let's just take a look at that. And I've got our function switch here set to the resistance range. And as you can see we're measuring 71, nearly 72 volts across the terminals here. Now I suspect that this voltage is actually current limited because it's probably being fed with quite a high value of series resistance. Maybe we can just find out. Okay so I'm not actually receiving an electric shock from the instrument at the moment. Can I actually feel anything? Oh yeah, actually I can. I'm just feeling, if I just touch the edge of the clips I'm just getting a little tingling feeling. So I've gone ahead and I've just reattached our voltmeter here. So you can see our 72 volts. Let's just see if that does come down when I touch the terminals. Okay, so the resistance of my body, it's actually pulling the voltage down to about, what was that? About 50 volts. Yeah, I can actually feel that. I'm getting a little bit of a tingle. Now, although this isn't dangerous for me, I can only just feel it. Obviously a lot of modern electronics equipment could be damaged by such a high voltage so this instrument really isn't suitable for testing low voltage components. And just out of interest let's see if the voltage is any different on the capacitance range. So we've switched the terminals to B and C now so we're on the bottom two terminals and we'll just select the capacitance range. So it can be actually even higher, 80 volts. Now I'm sure that most of you know when you're actually using things like the resistance range on a meter the actual meter only puts out just a couple of volts whereas this one is putting out in excess of 70 volts and of course many of you will be thinking well that's a great problem but you've got to remember what this piece of equipment was designed for so back in the day this was designed to work on valve equipment and valve equipment operates at high voltages so the components used within valve equipment could tolerate the 80 or so volts that this thing puts out but certainly you would have to be very cautious and careful about testing many of today's modern low voltage components so in summary I think our Lafayette model number TE46 capacitor resistor analyzer I actually think it's quite a good and useful instrument 
especially if you, like me, like to work on valve-based equipment. As you've seen throughout the video, the instrument isn't super accurate, but it is accurate enough for the purpose for which it was intended. And I certainly think one of the useful features of the analyzer here over something like our much more modern DER LCR meter is the fact that it can do these leakage tests and for me the fact that we can also use it to reform various electrolytic capacitors. So certainly leakage is something that the, uh, the modern meters can't do. Now I'm also not very sure about this power factor measurement which is used for measuring the goodness of electrolytic capacitors. I'm not sure how things like power factor measurement would compare to things like the ESR measurement. I'm not sure which would be the better indicator of a, a capacitor's goodness. I'm not really sure. Certainly I do think it's easier to use a modern meter with the ESR function than it is to take the power factor measurement. And as for the insulation resistance measurement here, I kind of think that it's probably in many cases easier to use something like a more modern digital meter like this, especially now these things are much lower cost than they used to be. But I think it's fair to say that in terms of a multifunction instrument, our CR analyzer here, our Lafayette, really can't be beaten because it does offer functions that neither of these meters do, and it offers them all in one rather neat package. So I'm going to give this instrument actually a big thumbs up. I didn't think I was going to like it at the start of the video, but it's actually grown on me. So I think if you're able to pick one of these instruments up at the right price, you could actually find it really useful. Now at nearly an hour long, I think today's video has gone on long enough. So I think that'll do. But until next time, and as always, thanks very much for watching, and I hope to see you again very soon. But until then, bye bye for now.